love my HBCU. Uh, and Bob, Bob, I love it, love it. Yeah. I love it, love it. Yeah, I love my HBCU. Yeah. And man, man, I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. Man. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I tune into the HCCU Sports Lab to see if my team won a loss. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouth. But if they won, keep tab. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, yeah. he know what he be talking about. Talkin Mike about. and Charles, Talk. they know what they be talking about. Talkin they about. compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a loss. Yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, uh, yes sir, yes, and pay attention, sir. cause he gonna teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Cavill inside the HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. As you see, Mike Washington is on assignment. I'm actually moving around myself. I'm here in Las Vegas. Had to make it stop out of here to do some business. I know some of y'all won't believe that, but uh, that's what it is. But we'll give you your news in terms of the unveiling of the top seven of the major division. But without further ado, uh, this is episode 564 of Inside the HBCU Sports Lab. That's covering the sporting HBCU dash for all things HBCU sports for institutions large and small. From the NAIA to the NCAA, we share insights and information on the HBCU sports culture, HBCU athletics, aesthetics to facilitate the story of HBCU athletic programs. The business of HBCU sports. Simply put, we call it the HBCU sports pedagogy. Again, I'm your host with Dr. Yada Cavill, co-host Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Today I have none other than A.D. Drew and Brian Fulford. With that, let's get into it. I see you, A.D. I see you, Brian. That means uh, we'll probably find a way to get in a little bit of talk with Jackson State and FAMU. And O'Brien, it worked out perfect, like you said, with Mississippi Valley and Bethune Cookman. 0 oh, 6, somebody, somebody will get their first win, conference win at that. So that's a big deal. With that being said, I am doing what you do in Las Vegas, but I'll leave that alone as I get it ready in this morning. With all that being said, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, it's 7 o'clock in Las Vegas, Dr. Kabir. It's 7.30. Right I've been up since 5.40, yes, so I need this to continue to make it. <laughs> Charles, how you doing today? Charles had me out all night. Uh, I, I got a, a tall cup of coffee this morning, Doc. I, I am uh, on the struggle bus, but we're going to push through. <laughs> See, I, I had to go back and put Charles online, make sure he understands how it goes for home coffee. See, if he was with Mike, <laughs> that would be a weird type of coffee he's drinking. But he's a good guy. I know he's drinking the regular kind of coffee. So he left it up to us, the prayer of you guys. And it looks like we have a lot of to drink for after this football game on Friday. That's for another discussion altogether. With that being said, uh, Brian, how are you doing today? Ah, it's JSU hate week. Sorry, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hyped. Uh, I, saved all, I saved all my energy last week. I laid quiet in the cut, tried to be chill, tried to grape, rest up my energy. It's on. It's on. We coming. We coming, Charles. We really? Coming. We coming. Really? All 10 of y'all coming. All right. All 10 of us. All 10 of us. <laughs> <laughs> Not 100. All 10 of us. Exactly. <laughs> With that being said, let me go to you, A.D. Drew. How are you doing today? Well, Charles had me up all night, too, uh, uh, listening to the Charles the Charles show with another <laughs> swack overtime game on a game that should have never gone into overtime. But, Brian, Charles, as much as y'all are looking for the big battle between Jackson State and FAMU, and, of course, I'm looking uh, forward to it as a FAMU alum, <laughs> I am also looking forward to the Toilet Bowl, which are the only two winless HBCU football teams battling next Saturday also. Mm. Good stuff. So let's get into it so I can give you these uh, scores from the top seven. We'll start with the mid-majors, and we'll start with those receiving votes. Omni State Golden Rams, they lost uh, to number nine, Miles Golden Bears. That was 32-21. to 21. 
Miles Golden Bears took care of business. Uh, they also are coming in at number nine. And as we said, they defeated Albany State, the number eight team at the time, 32-31, when you talk about week number five for them. Fayetteville State Broncos, three and two, uh, two and one. They took a loss. They lost to number six, Livingston Blue Bears, who uh, had a great victory if you consider how people's expectations for them coming into the season. Top is up, bottom is down, or bottom is up, top is down. You know, in the CIAA, we can't tell it. We'll see what that means as we get into the other scores. 24 to 19 was that score for the Livingston Blue Bears. Great job by them, I must add. With that being said, let's get into what happened at number seven in the poll rankings. As we said, in six years, Livingston Blue Bears defeating uh, essentially number 10 in the poll. Which was in that case, we just talked about the tough loss from Fayetteville State, surprising a lot of folks. I should say at number uh, five, as we keep moving through here, yeah, Winston Salem State. I mean, excuse me, Shaw Bears, number four, defeats Winston Salem State, thirty-four to fourteen, as they improved to four and three, two and two overall. Number four, yeah, Winston Salem State defeated the number five Shaw Bears, five and two, three and one. Uh, as they uh, continue to march through with a tough uh, loss there to Charles Bear. At number three, Virginia Union Panthers continue to do what they do as they won uh, Elizabeth City State Vikings 4 2, bringing us to West Virginia State. Uh, they continue to march through conference play. We'll see what that means when they get into some tougher competition. But they defeated the Concord Cougars 44 14. They're 5 1 4 0 uh, in the thoughts process. And number one, Johnson C. Smith. Did not play. What are your thoughts on the top seven this week in terms of the rankings? I'll go with you in terms of your thoughts, Charles. Uh, I, I think the Fayetteville State loss, that was the one that jumped out for me. Uh, when you take a look at what Livingstone was able to do, uh, it is the arrival of uh, Livingstone football, if you will. Uh, that's the one that really stands out to me. And then you take a look at what Clark was able to do on the road, albeit – <laughs> Not on TV at the end, but they were, able to, <laughs> they were able to get that, able to get that win uh, in the final few seconds. I mean, a lot of exciting football yesterday, but those two games that jumped out for me. Uh, let me make sure I get some love to Clark Atlanta as they go up to Ohio, uh, which Central State and get it done. Come from behind late in that game, twenty-five to twenty, as they get it done at the number seventeen. So. Uh, We'll see this week do some CIAA teams, as AD said, they were flirting a couple tough some weeks ago, that it would get to the point you'll start seeing CIAA teams beat on each other, which will make space for the SIAC. And you would think Miles Golden Bears maybe be able to find a way up into the question is, is who drops out? Last week was Virginia State. Uh, this week we'll see who gets uh, jettison, if you would, from the top seven or if any teams do. With that being said, let me go to you, A.D. Drew, with that talk. What were your thoughts in terms of those top seven teams in terms of the scores this past weekend? Uh, while Charles hit on the CIAA, I want to hit on the SIAC and the fact that Miles won, uh, defeated Albany State in a game. Miles uh, – Dominated the first half of the game. Albany State made a good run there late third, early fourth quarter, and Miles held on and uh, put on a late touchdown to go ahead and seal that game. So that one, uh, that one's going to go a long way in determining the SIAC as I believe Miles and Clark Atlanta still have to play. So, you know, everybody still controls their own destiny, but uh, another victory by Miles against the Clark Atlanta, that's going to pretty much uh, seal up that number one seed for the SIAC, where Clark still has a couple of uh, couple of tough games left. Albany State has a couple of tough games left, and Fort Valley has a couple of tough games left. So they'll be battling that out. And I hate to say it, keep an eye on Tuskegee. They've only got that one loss. And they still control their own destiny also because they play Clark, 
they play miles, so they control their own destiny. So the good thing about what you said, the SIC, everybody who's in contention, if they win, they're in. They control their own their own destiny. They don't have to score both watch. So that one, and then what the hell is going on in the Swack West, man? We saw three games. Hold on, we're gonna get into the top seven poll rankings for major division. We'll get okay. to that. They got plenty of discussion going there. Let me go around. <laughs> <laughs> I got to say about that. I know you do. I'll let you say it. But let me. Oh, go. and uh, one other thing. Can I get one other thing in? Uh, yes. Players out to Florida Memorial. Uh, they they did not play. I don't believe the entire conference that they're in played because the conference is based in the state of Florida with the aftermaths of Hurricane Milton. So uh, their their game was postponed. So uh, so prayers out to all those in the Florida community who are affected by Hurricane Milton. And football obviously is secondary due to the cleanup. That includes Bethune Cookman. I know I told you not to talk about mid-majors, majors. I talk about majors, but to your point, you're absolutely right. Although Bethune Cookman could get their game in, they were traveling, uh, but I'm hearing some uh, challenging news again from their campus. So let's keep them in your prayers as well. Brian, with that being said, what are your thoughts in terms of what took place at the mid-major level this week? Well, you know, Charles said – you know, the Fayetteville State loss. But I'm going to flip it on the other side and talk about the Livingstone College win. The Big Bad Blue Bears. I mean, it, it was just a good weekend for anybody that wanted to use the phrase Big Bad. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if the, if the Blue Bears say that, but I just thought since the alliteration of bees, you know, I love the letter B, so I'm just going to go with it. Big Bang Blue Bears. Um, you know, uh, it's been, I, I just did the research, right? Since 2009, they have only had two seasons of which they have won five games. Two, right? Uh, 2014, they went five and five. 2015, they went five and four. So with four games remaining on the schedule, they are like they, they're on the verge of a historic season, right? I mean, they're actually in contention to get to the CIAA championship game. I mean, you talked about what's upside down. The, the CIAA South, I mean, it's like Virginia Union versus everybody, right? In the CIAA, right? Or at least the old North versus the old South. I know, I know it's all. It's all new now, but uh, just an outstanding job by Livingstone. And, uh, yeah, shout out to uh, Winston-Salem State as well. Um, you know, good win on, on against uh, against uh, Shaw. But uh, I will say this from a, from a HBCU watching perspective, I need all of my entities, all of my broadcasters, we got to do better. We got to do better. We got to, we got to, and that's IDs. We got to give the broadcasters the roster. We got to know who's, who's calling, you know, who's that quarterback. Not just number 17, not just 34 running the ball. Let's give these kids some names. Let's put some names on these kids. I mean, there's too much action being shown, an unprecedented year of coverage. And I feel like we're kind of muddling through it here at the midway point of the season. I would have accepted that at the first week or two, but here we are in week five, six, seven. I don't really know, depending upon the division. But it's like, come on, let's 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 step our games up. Broadcasters, production people, SIDs. Let's let's give some some even though the even though the action, the refereeing on the field ain't always great. At least let's be great from our broadcasting perspective. So that's my little rant, but I'm going to get off of it. But congratulations to Livingstone. Congratulations to Winston-Salem State. And, uh, yeah, that's it. I could answer some of those questions for you, Brian, but I'm not, that's a whole other made. podcast. Great points made there uh, in terms of what Brian said. I like the comments when they're talking about Johnson C. Smith and Livingston if they somehow make it to the CIAA championship. Boy, it'd be historic in so many different ways. I know WSSU Ram Nation is saying, hey, we want to find our way in there and crash the party. But we'll see. Uh, Virginia Union is doing their things, and they're going to be a tough one to keep out of the championship game, particularly when they got that mulligan 
on what many thought originally was a conference loss, but because they played eight CIAA and only seven count, for them, the loss did not count, although the win counted uh, for the other team. With that being said, let's get into the major division. Well, we can start hearing maybe about some of the West contests that uh, AD you kind of alluded to early, and the many of us were enthralled with as Charles Bishop was on the call with Swag Digital Network. At the time, we went to bed last night, and I told Charles they had over 17,000 views of the game. So no telling what it is this morning. Uh, with that being said, let's get in this breakdown. Receiving votes. Howard Bison, uh, they get a win. Non-conference, as you know, playing throughout the MEAC this time of the year, they're 3-0. and Defeated Sacred Heart Pioneers, went up late in that game, 21-14. to I just have a question in terms of who is doing their home broadcast. The guy, uh, and I got some insight that the Howard folks were fans, were not necessarily excited about that, but I was amazed. He made it sound like it was the refs that took the win, took the win from Sacred Heart. I was like, who are you pulling for? And it wasn't like it was that obvious to call. It was weird to listen to. Hampton Pirates uh, did not play their three and three. Uh, you got the Alcorn State Braves. Uh, they defeated Ground State 17 15 on the field goal at the end of the game. Big win by the Braves over Ground going in the, the hole and getting it done. Amazing. The field goal kicker kind of sliced a little bit, but uh, a big first down before that put him right in the range where it didn't matter because it went through the uprights. And at the end of the day, all you see is the final score that the field goal was good. And it worked out for the Braves. Getting into the top seven, Morgan State Bears lost uh, the Merrimack Warriors 32-24. I think that's a tough conference loss. Special teams let them down because Merrimack scored at least 14, maybe 21 points, depending on how you look at it. Uh, off of the special teams flaws by Morgan State, they got it done to Warriors. At number six, South Carolina State Bulldogs still sit at three and two as they did not play. I should say Morgan State Bears failed at three and four. Number five, I told you. Brown State lost to Alcorn State. That's essentially a matchup of five versus eight. And number eight came in and got it done in a slight upset if you look at the rankings. Bramlin falls to three and three. And now 0 oh and two in conference after uh, looking good in a victory over Jackson State. But it was a non conference conference game. So it didn't count uh, for them in terms of win column. But the two that did, they didn't get done. Right. Uh, at number four, Tennessee State Tigers defeated Eastern Illinois Panthers 41 to 17. Uh, they got down and, and did it really well. Homecoming, not a lot of fans seeing it, but a lot of fans heard about it because they were celebrating. Things got off on a great start Friday, got to show some love in terms of how they look like with first take. Um, so they have a lot of momentum uh, to all the credit. They said at five and two overall, and three and one in the OBC Big South uh, merger conference. At number three, Jackson State Tigers sit at 4 and 2, 2 and 0 in the conference play. They did not play. And number two, Family Rallies did not play 3 and 2, 1 and 0. Uh, but with everything else taking place, it sets up for a big talking points this week in terms of this matchup of two top seven teams. Looks like they'll both maybe be top five, top three. We'll see what that looks like. North Carolina Central Eagles did what Texas Southern couldn't do against Virginia Lynchburg. And did what the number one team does when they play a team at such caliber. They shut them out on the defensive side and put up 68 on the offensive side. Kind of looked like the type of game they had against the Aggies, but even worse. But we'll leave that right there. They're five and two, one and zero. Oh. Uh, eight first place votes as they go into this week with the major. Uh, in terms of that, before we get into this next break, uh, quickly let me go around and get your thoughts. I'll start with you, Brian. Um, my so my initial thought, I, I'm gonna tell you my play of the day, right? It was a pretty much a meh day for me. Uh, but I love the the somehow Tennessee State was a two point underdog, an underdog at home, and I think that they stayed an underdog all the way up to game time. And I just kept looking at the line, like, all homecoming, all homecoming against a one in five team. You talk about a big miss by by the people who make these numbers. I mean, that was free money. That was free money. I mean, there, there are very few occasions when you can – sometimes when you are looking at the FCS markets, you can find free money. That was free money. 
if you took advantage of it, congratulations. Uh, you know, I tried to get in on it. You know, made made some fumbles, messing around with Grambling. I got to learn how to stay away from the West. I, my, my, my guy, Kelf Rosen, tells me. Stay away from the West. He said, Fine, stay away from the West. But I'm like a, I'm like a, I'm like a, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to use anything not inappropriate. But Baby Drew? I go back for punishment every time. Uh, speaking of the of, of the West, we saw three games in the West. One, UAPB pretty much owned the game against Prairie View. Prairie View did try to make a one run. And in the other two games, uh, we saw we saw Alcorn State have the game one, give it away, and then and then take it back at the at the last moment. And then Charles, I mean, we saw we saw Southern who did everything they could to lose that game yesterday, and then uh, Texas Southern uh, finds. Defeat from the jaws of victory on yesterday with the with the it, it almost looked like it was tried it was a drop kick but the but the punter uh, muffed the punt and you know we'll talk about it in a little bit go for the safety there not go for the safety there analytics say one thing your head says another I think there was a lot of discussion. Charles pointed out in the broadcast, which I think there's a perfect job of a play-by-play to do that. Ultimately, even if you look at the coach's decision, it wasn't as if the kick was blocked. Um, and I don't know if you can take that into calculation that you're a kicker, and I don't want to put too much on the young man and what, what it was, you know. But – it wasn't blocked. He slippedly missed it as he was dropping it down in his connection, and he literally kicked it into the back of his protection at the front. He had plenty of room, more than normal distance, so everything was set up for him just to do what he normally does, and for whatever reason, when you're dealing with high school or college kids oftentimes, uh, even sometimes in the pro where they get paid for it, you get these uh, plays which just kind of befuddles you and I think because so much furious action was going on, everybody just believed that it was blocked. I went back last night and actually watched it. It was not blocked. Charles, what are your final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, and then get into the poll rankings next. Yeah, I, I think that was a big uh, takeaway from yesterday. Uh, uh, of course, I think Alcorn going to Grambling, getting a win on the road. Anytime you went on the road, that's huge. But especially at Grambling, tough place to play. And then. I'm, we're we're going to get into it, uh, Southern and, and Texas Southern. Uh, when you talk about it, I don't think I've ever seen up close snatching victory from the jaws of defeat the, the way I saw it last night with regards to Southern and Texas Southern. But uh, that was – it was just amazing, the, 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 the flip of emotions, because literally during the broadcast I'm talking about Texas Southern has not beaten Southern in Houston since 2011, and – Within the next 30 seconds, everything changed. Uh, so it was just amazing to be a part of uh, a broadcast like that and to see it actually happen. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get into it. Yeah, we saw it flash in it that he kicked it into the waist of the Southern players. I want to get it corrected because this is how you look at coaching moves. It actually kicked off – a Texas Southern player, his protection, and slid off him and went into the Southern player next. It went into his own player first. It was not blocked. They may credit it as a block in terms of the stats because that's just how the stats fall. But if you go back and watch live, you will see that it was not blocked by Southern. It was kicked into the back of his own player, careened off of a Southern guy, went forward, Texas Southern, uh, offensive lineman to their credit picked it up and moved, ran it forward and almost miraculously got a first down but they were so behind the chains that it wasn't quite enough and we saw the rest which was history credit to Southern because they played to it that's two overtime wins in the West uh, two straight uh, conference games where they get it done let's take our first break we'll come back in our next poll and we'll actually avail see how that affected the top seven in the major division we we'll get a chance to get a little more talk about that because that is the talk in the last segment. We'll go in on next week's games, particularly.
taking a focus at this top 25 matchup in terms of fam, you being ranked, and we'll, then we'll go in there and get some more. At Auto Masters LLC, our mission is to serve our community by providing quality automobiles at affordable prices. All of our vehicles are inspected and certified to offer you the confidence in knowing you have a quality vehicle. Our goal is to provide you with a seamless process and positive experience for your automobile purchase. Financing recommendations and specific vehicle inquiries are available at your request. You can find us at www.automasters06.com and like, follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Also, please feel free to contact Terrence Miles at 601-927-7794. And oh yeah, tell him Sonya sent you. Compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot, yeah, and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, yes sir, yes sir. And pay attention, cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Phil with Inside the HBCU Sports Lab. Let me get into the top poll rankings and go around and see what your thoughts are on as we get it going. As I said, during the break, I had to take a little bit of my tomato juice, just for everybody to know out there a little bit of what that looks like. And you see how I was, I'm really nice with it. Uh, with that being said, uh, dropping out this week is none other than Morgan State Bears, three and four. Um, hadn't got in the conference play. Also dropping out, as you probably would imagine, is Grandma State Tigers at a 3-3 three and three in 0 and 2 Receiving votes are Alabama State Hornets that are 3-3, three 2-1. and, three, two and one. Hampton Pirates are sitting at 3-3, three and three and they're 0 and 2 As you know, they did not play. Alabama State Hornets got a big win over uh, Valley. And Alabama a and Bulldogs uh, won over Bethune-Cookman. Uh, they improved to 3-3 three and three and 1-1, one and one, 124 points, as they are both just outside of the top seven, which means let's get into the top seven. Howard Bison jumped back into the poll rankings this week as they improved with the victory at home, 3-3 three and three on the season, 156 points, as they were not ranked. You got the Alcorn State Braves that enter into the fold at number six with a big win on the road to improve the 4-3 overall to get towards a winning record. But more importantly, they improved the 3-0 and and had the head-to-head tiebreaker with Grambling State, if you would, 166 points, which sets up a big matchup this weekend. We'll talk a little bit more about that as well. While all the focus will be on the Eastern Division, there will be some good uh, talk probably about the West Division in terms of the matchup to come. At number five, South Carolina State Bulldogs are three and two, uh, as they did not play, but they're at 178 points with six first place votes. Bringing us to number four, which is Jackson State Tigers, they improved the uh, a stay at four and two and two and all. I should say but they earned a first place vote, even though they were off at 189 points. We'll see what that came from. As number three, Fam, you rather sit at three and two, one and zero with one first place vote, 190 points. Both those teams were previous two and three, respectively. So let's see who's at number two jumping into the mix. Tennessee State Tigers, five and two, three and one. Wow. One first place votes, 219 points. They move up two spots from number four to get to number two. A lot of that is because, frankly, FAMU and Jack State did not play, and the probably voters did that. But they play, and whoever wins that game, I would guess, would probably jump over that. It hurts to some degree, FAMU as they have one game missing on the ledger that was out of their control, they'll get that back. So a lot of time for a lot of things to change. But at this point, at number two, the Tennessee State Tigers, they've just won. They've won three straight. They're now 3-1 and one in conference play. And as I said, they have one first-place vote. Bringing us to number one. That's North Carolina Central, 5-2, and 1-0. Oh. Eight first-place votes, 224 points as they get it done. I'm going to go to Charles first since he jumped out there and said, wow. As if he didn't understand the poll ranking, so we'll let him explain his commentary and thoughts at this moment. No, nigga, shout out to the fighting Brandon Kings, uh, Tennessee State, jumping in there uh, at number two. I mean, uh, that caught me off guard. I wasn't ready for that, but big homecoming win. And, you know, we talked about this before in terms of Tennessee State. Uh, how do they look as they start getting into conference play? But, you know, we're, you know, mid-October and things are looking good up there in Nashville thus far. Uh, 
again, uh, you take your hat off to the Alcorn State Braves. Big win yesterday. I'm concerned uh, as a fan, quarterback play, whether you're, you're talking in the SWAC or in the MEAC or, or, or whatever conference, uh, what I'm starting to just kind of hone in on is uh, the pass attempts are, are somewhere under 20, you know, so it's limiting the liability of the quarterback. And you're relying on a running game and defense to win you some ball games. When you run up against a good team, what's that quarterback play going to look like? So keep an eye on that going forward. Good stuff. I'm going to go to you, A.D. Drew. It seemed like you were a little excited yourself. So I'm going to go to you and get your thoughts and save Brian to the end to see if he's going to upset the apple cart or it's going to be Drew as Charles tried to be nice after he uh, jumped out there a little bit. Uh, Drew, Drew, what are your thoughts? Uh, Tennessee State. I'm going to stay on this Tennessee State for a minute. Should If Tennessee State wins out, which means they would defeat Howard this week, and gets a bust into the FCS playoffs, do we start to consider possibly a split national championship? Because Tennessee State will be 3-0 and against HBCUs. Just got to put it... Just got to put it out there as a thought for discussion. Obviously, the big matchup this week is going to be number three versus number four. Uh, number number one is off uh, this week. Will a victory by who, whoever wins that three four matchup? Will that be enough to vault them into the number one position over an idle North Carolina Central team? Some, something else to consider. So, and then and then you and then you got Alcorn who with a victory especially with this being a division game, can essentially put themselves in a damn good position to win the West because they were on uh, one of the early tiebreakers in the West should should they be tied with anybody else in the West for that division crown because the victory against Southern makes them 4-0 in the West. So ju- just a few other th- few things that I want to uh, that I want people to think about. And I, I just got to say this one last thing about that game last night, Charles. That was a great job of you and Charles setting up that last, those last couple of plays when you guys asked during the timeout, should they take the safety at this point in time? And I was thinking, oh, you know, at that point in time, hell no, that's, that is not the football play. <laughs> but I mean, damn, it, it comes into play. So I want to say as, as a broadcast team, you guys did a A-plus job. Uh, 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 Dr. Kavir, he don't need to come back to class anymore. He, he went on ahead and earned it with that project right there. <laughs> Thank you. You're right. You're right. He don't have to worry about the finals. He has A's he all on his exams throughout the test. And I'm glad you put that back out there in terms of kudos. And you're appropriate. Great job, Charles. That's what you expect from your uh, play-by-play, and as well as color, more importantly, is to look at those things that you don't consider because they may come in play. Uh, so perfectly done. A.D. Drew, before I go to Brian, because I think you bring up uh, an important point. Those polls where you have voters, I think you certainly will have some voters for Tennessee State as a national championship in regards to if they can get it done. But I think they need a little help. It's going to be interesting to see all those teams in the OBC big stuff will any of them get in the top 25. The reason I say that. Um, you have the fact that it, it looks like what we thought may have happened last year with North Carolina Central and FAMU. I know Jackson State and Charles will say, hold up a minute, we got a game that needs to be played. But I think they need some help either with like an upset by FAMU, as we mentioned by Jackson State, or an upset to North Carolina Central. The reason I say that, if you play this out and you get North Carolina Central Eagles and FAMU rattles clashing, you could have a top 15, top 10 matchup with them beating some ranked team. And I think that's going to be a hard argument if Tennessee State doesn't have the same type of scheduling. But to your point, you don't have to break down the dialogue. I think you put your point out there and it's well stated. I think at the end of the day, you still will have some voters that may look at the entire framework of Tennessee State uh, schedule. And in some ways, it matters maybe how deep they go in the OBC to help them kind of push over the edge to get the final note. Uh, I think if a SWAC West team wins the celebration bowl. On the clock. Hold on. Let's go to Brown. All right. 
Um, you know, the, the, the equivalent of what happened at the end of that Texas Southern Southern game, Drew will appreciate this. This was the equivalent of the debate that us basketball coaches have being up three mm. under like 10 seconds. Do you foul? Do you foul or do you let it play out? Um, so that is an interesting coaching philosophy. I would hope on the SWAT coaches call, every coach should get asked that question. Every coach should get asked from the SWAT media day, uh, hey, coach, what would you do in a situation where, you know, you're up by a touchdown, under 20 seconds, backed up on your own 15-yard line, uh, do you punt it or do you roll back and take the safety? I think it's a fair question to be asked. So I'm just throwing that out there to anybody who uh, wants to uh, go down that road. And it's not cut and dry. It is not. It is not. You know, I've already talked to one coach and he was like Drew said, it's not the coaching. It's not the coaching move. You know, the coaching move is, yeah, you punt it. And you don't expect that young man to shank that punt the way he did. Uh, So. And we're not having this conversation. You're right. You're right. Well, let's take our next Next break, we'll come back on the other side. We'll get in some of these matchups so we get a chance to talk a little bit more about what you're just talking about in the next segment and look at a couple of other games that stood out this weekend. Uh, shout out, for example, Pine Bluff getting a big win over Prairie View, a uh, conference win, first conference win this season. Obviously, they ended last season. And in a lot of ways, in some people's mind, probably put Prairie View out of their misery and have them look into basketball. I know technically Prairie View's not out of it, uh, but so many tiebreakers, and they just have to do a clean sweep of the season. It's going to be challenging. Uh, with that being said, let's take our next break. We'll come back on the other side and talk about some of the games of this week, what stood out, and give a chance for A.D. Drew to get a little more explanation of how he sees things going forward when we'll get in that, the last segment, talking about some key matchups as we go down the stretch. Stick with us. We'll be right Looking for the ultimate cultural experience of 2025? The Zora Outdoor Festival of the Arts is where you need to be. From January 31st to February 2nd, Eatonville, Florida will come alive with incredible live performances from the Levert Experience and Sunshine Anderson. Immerse yourself in interactive art. Take a journey through history with a new virtual tour app that brings Eatonville's legacy to life from your phone. Enjoy family-friendly STEM activities and explore over 80 unique vendors. Please don't miss the unforgettable R&B tribute to the legends. This is more than a festival. It's a celebration of Eatonville's rich cultural heritage. Visit ZoraFestival.org for tickets or to become a vendor. We'll see you in Eatonville, the oldest black incorporated municipality in the country. Compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they wanna love that. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor uh, Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And pay attention, yes, sir. cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Will inside the HBC Sports Lab. These gentlemen are in their humble abodes. I'm in Las Vegas doing what you do and drinking uh, tomato juice in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> like said, and I have wait, 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 wait. I, I, I don't see you push the button, <laughs> Doc. Put over here, I see that the slot machines are right over there. There so you go. What that means if I don't come back to work, that means I hit big. If I do, uh, just stay up there to make sure I have my rent to be paid this month. With that being said, hey, let me go to you. Mm-hmm. And you can get your thoughts on that. But I want you to get a chance to get in here and talk about some of the games that stood out to you. And that you can kind of play it out uh, wherever direction you want to go. Uh, CIAA, SIAC, MEAC, and their non conference matchups with SWAC, uh, where a lot of fans were watching. Evident when you had those many folks following Charles. I'm going to give Charles the, the update on that. He had some of the calls on SWAC digital, uh, SWAC digital media. I should say, and that's because Charles was on the call. Uh, well, uh, I, I, I want to quickly go back to the Tennessee State point. I think if a SWAC West team comes out and actually makes it to Atlanta and wins in Atlanta I in did. the Celebration Bowl, oh, and Tennessee State does what I said. I agree with that. I think that opens the debate. I think whoever, whoever, if Jackson State or FAMU comes out 
and wins the swag along with a central, I don't think there's a debate at all. Uh, it's going to be whoever whoever wins that clash. But definitely if a West team wins it all, I think there may be some questions about uh, about it. Uh, just throwing that back up there. But, uh, I agree, except for if it's maybe all point because they have Jackson State still on the schedule. That means uh, they either have beat Jackson State twice or it's beat Jackson State in all form. But to your point, if any other team in the West, without a doubt, Tennessee State back in it easily. Yeah, yeah, that that definitely back in. Speaking speaking of speaking Jackson of back, if it's, if it's like a Southern uh, struggling, whatever, and maybe let's say a Howard or South Carolina State. Yeah, and, and speaking of back in it, Doctor Cavill, you know that. Let's let's go to the CIAA and let's look at the old South and see how this thing may may play out. You may have a Johnson C. Smith and a Livingstone in, in the championship game. You may have you you still may have Union coming up out of this thing when it's all said and done in a rematch against Johnson C. Smith. Somebody put in the chat a long time ago who's who's going to be the CIAA representative. For the uh, Florida Beach Bowl, I, I, damn good representative. Whoever uh, gets left out of the Division Two playoffs, and I hate to say it, that person may be playing the SIAC champion because the SIAC champion may not be high enough in the ranking to even get to yeah. the Division Two playoffs. So we've got to keep that in mind, especially. If uh, whoever wins the SIAC has uh, one, maybe two conference losses, winds up winning the the SIAC. And Charles, great job yesterday. I'm gonna I'm gonna say it again, but wasn't it refreshing that at seven o'clock Eastern, six o'clock Central, there was only one game for us to focus on, yeah. and that <laughs> game happened to be yeah. a competitive game. It got, off slow, got off to a slow start. But once once the scoring started, both of them, uh, I think both of them scored their first touchdowns on defense, if I remember that correctly. And That's then good. then we had a competitive game that went that went in overtime. So you know that that definitely helped with the numbers on top of the broadcasters that they had in that particular game. Well, I, I told Doc last night. I said, you know, it'd be kind of interesting. You know, that, that big game, that one kind of gets flexed to that, that prime swag time or that 6 o'clock time, and all eyeballs become on that game where you have, you know, the other games at either 2 or 4 o'clock. That's a brilliant point made by both of you, and uh, I'm sure they're kind of noticing that, and it'll be interesting to see can they flex that a little more, if not all the time, more often, particularly when you have these feature matchups that are not necessarily picked up on ESPN or you can see maybe ESPN, ESPN2 uh, finding a way to kind of get their hands on it as well. So great move. Go ahead and continue, Charles, as um, you jumped in there. Let's get your thoughts on some of the big games this weekend. I know you had to see games earlier as you got into your call and things started. You may not have seen the backside. But what stood out to you uh, one way or the other in terms of matchups this uh, past Saturday? Well, yeah, and, and, and like you said, we're talking about Tennessee State in October. That's that's big. So I think you know Tennessee State uh, continuing to win and continuing to keep that momentum going. I, I think that's uh, big in, in that regards. I think the one that kind of slid under the radar, but it was a good matchup. But Winston Salem State taking care of Shaw uh, yesterday. That was another one that that that, that caught my eye. I mentioned, of course, uh, uh, Livingstone taking down. Uh, Fayetteville State, but then, you know, the game last night with regards to Texas Southern and Southern, you know, it was a defensive slog, and then everything just starts happening, you know, in the last, you know, 15, 20 minutes of the game, and I, and I, and I think it was, it, it, it shocked everybody. I, I think I made mention on the broadcast how it was almost sort of a, a pall that kind of, uh, you know, uh, wafted over the Texas Southern side, because it was just unbelievable, unbelievable to sit there and watch. And we're talking about this play. Oh, if only for the for the fact that I've seen Texas Southern have issues with their punts. Uh, the, the process or the operation hasn't always been clean. Jack State was able to block a punt on last week. And that's what made me start to think, 
just take the operation part out of play. I know it's 20 some odd seconds left, but take the safety and and rest on your secondary because Chris Dishman really likes their Texas Southern secondary in terms of going up against the Southern receiver. So all that went into play in terms of starting to think about how the last part of that game should have played out. Good stuff, good stuff. I see the Raider fans are coming in as they get ready. Uh, the, the host Steelers, fascinating to see as they moved obviously from L.A., uh, Oakland, to L.A., to Oakland, to now <laughs> – Las Vegas, uh, how they come out, those fans traveling in. So you got some dispersed Steelers, too. But the NFL is a beast, and they find a way to get it done. But that being said, Brian, uh, what are your thoughts in terms of some of those matchups that stood out to you? What what has your interest uh, this last night or this morning in terms of Saturday and Friday games? What the hell, Grambling? What the hell? That's all I'm going to say. I mean, oh my God. I mean, that's a game you haven't lost in the hole in, a, in to, to all corn in, I don't know. I mean, I got high school kids that might not have been born the last time that uh, that that you that you lost the all corn in the hole. But but um, there was a stretch in the second quarter where I'm watching this game between all corn and grambling. And I may have even tweeted this out. It was some bad football, guys. It was hard. It was hard to watch. I mean, this, I'm sitting here flipping between games, and I'm I'm watching some non-HBCU games, and I'm flipping to some HBCU games, and then I get stuck with this grambling Alcorn game. It was bad. Just, I mean, in the second quarter, it was bad. I mean, I'm I'm like Alcorn multiple drives that just resulted in turnovers. I mean, then you had the officiating, which I don't know what was going on. It was just a bad look on television. And so, got to do better. Got to do better. Coaches, referees, broadcast people. It was just a tough weekend uh, of, of college football. Everybody's got to do better. Second half of the season. So, I'm, I'm passing out grades. Everybody, do better. Please. Charles, Brian tells you your lecture of the day. You better do better. You have to do better. You got to do better. With that, I'm going to do better and take uh, the next break and get prepared as I get into some of my tomato juice as we're here in Las Vegas. Let's take our next break. Last break. <laughs> Good for the morning. It's good for the soul. Yeah. Yeah, we'll be right back seriously after our last break. We'll come back on the other side and start talking about next weekend. It's turn, time to turn the page. I know a couple of folks will wait until after the Monday media uh, as they try to digest what took place this weekend. But for us, we'll turn the page and get into the next week's games. You'll get a chance to check out with Brian this evening as he gets into the mix and talks a little bit about what took place on the sports wrap. And then they'll officially turn the page uh, as you move from what took place in week uh, seven, if you're in the major, to week eight and six and seven, if you're in the mid-major. With that, we'll be right back after this last break. Hey, grab me one, too. A.D. Drew and I are co-hosts of the BCSN Sports Wrap. We talk about all things related to HBCU athletics. From the games, teams, coaches, and fan interest stories, we cover it all. You can find our shows on Facebook at BCSN Sports Wrap, YouTube at MyJBN Online, and everywhere you listen to podcasts like Anchor, Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcasts. You can also find the show on the Jericho Broadcast Network's app. Make sure to download. We look forward to you joining the conversation and being a part of the show. This is the Dean of the College of HBCU Sports, Kenyatta Cavill of Dr. Cavill's Inside the HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. 
Come mix it up in the lab where the course lecture is in session every Tuesday from 6 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook Live, YouTube, Spreaker, or the BCSN app. As we discuss all things about the HBCU sports culture, including exploring the week that was in the sporting HBCU dash, as well as the upcoming week of HBCU sports. With me, the Dean, the College of HBCU Sports, on Dr. Cavill's Inside HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Watts and Charles Bishop. Course lecture dismissed. Choice Hotels is a family of brands that helps you get the most for your money so you can be any traveler you want to be. You could be a free hot breakfast hero in a comfort hotel. Yes! That's how you waffle! Mr. This Script got a plot twist at a Radisson Hotel. A business big leaguer! Go for key! Even the ultimate pool float inflator! With 22 brands and the best value for your money, Choice Hotels has a stay for any you. Book direct at choicehotels.com, where travels come true. Gotta get the corners. When you're looking for the latest information on Southern University Sports, the Southwestern Athletic Conference, and HBCU Athletics, there's only one place to go. Tune in to the Carlos Brown Show, exclusively on the Black College Sports Network. Compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they're going to tell you if your team, if they want to love that. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And pay attention because he's going to teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Bill with Inside the HBC Sports Lab. As we get into our last thing, it's time to talk in the matchups. I'm going to talk the juice, if you would allow me to kind of say that for last, because uh, I really want us to be able to get into that. But let me at least give some updates of what's taking place in the CIAA uh, as, as well as the SIAC talk maybe a little bit about the MEAC, Independence, their matchups. It's got the big ones, but Showtime, the big story, uh, is really in the SWAC, and it happens to be in the Eastern Division. And I'll actually flip it. I'm going to start there, and then we'll get into the other. Let's not tease it out. Let's let the people get what they want to hear, which is a matchup from FAMU and Jackson State. This matchup goes back to history. Uh, years for those that may not realize that have been that uh, understanding of this. This actually goes back uh, to the first year of when it took to another level. It went before that, I should say, when you had national black college championships on the line based on the Negro newspapers of uh, football championships. Those were in the Orange Blossom Classics, uh, other classics, but it took another level in the inaugural year of the what was known then as the 1AA playoffs, which you know now the FCS playoffs, when these two teams met in Jackson in a semifinal matchup. Historically, a lot of people thought then that that was the de facto championship. And in fact, it came out that way as FAMU uh, won uh, what is recorded now as the only HBCU to win a 1AA playoff, and there are many Jackson State fans that still believe to this day that that was their championship, that they could not get it done at home. But I see people smiling, and, and I want to put the history out there because when you talk about these matchups and we understand how do you market and brand this, AD, with, particularly as a marketing guru, uh, particularly what he's doing even more so now at Morehouse, he understands how you sell that, how you put that in the forefront of tying up the big matchup, which we'll get to short in terms of what it means today. Uh, but I wanted to touch a little bit of history. FAMU went on to win that game, classic matchup with anybody that had a chance to be there in person. It's one of those games that more people now say they were there at the game. When you look at the attendance, which was significant, was impossible to have. And some people were born after the game. They still swear that they were at the game. But that's another discussion for another day. It just lets you know how yeah. much it of Jackson is State for a Right, exactly, Charles. Up to okay. that. FAMU won that game and went on to win the one double A championship. Then we have enough couple of these other championships, if you would, in regards to uh, how this game has played out the last three years since FAMU has won uh the twenty uh joined the SWAC in twenty twenty one. First two years the matchup went into Jackson State. Last year, fam, you got some payback, and they went and won the game and went on to win uh, the Celebration Bowl in a classic matchup against Howard. 
ultimately giving them a national championship. So fascinating when you talk about that. Uh, let me go to A.D. Drew first uh, in terms of this dialogue. What are your thoughts in terms of this big matchup this weekend? FAMU, Jackson State. FAMU comes in as a top 25 team, but they got to go on the road. They come into my rankings as number three. Jackson State is number four. You got a top five matchup, top four matchup in the top seven with three versus four. Everything is on the line in terms of this game. Uh, in October, it moved from the first of the year, which many people wanted it back in the season. And you see why, because how much it resonates with folks. Well, to me, I think the one thing that uh, to look at for this particular matchup, let's look at let's look into the trenches. You know, FAMU has not ran the ball as well as they would like to. And on the flip side, has not been able to stop the run as well as as they would uh, lo love to have stopped the run. Jackson State, on the other hand, has shown that they have the ability to run the ball. Does Jackson State have the ability to stop FAMU uh, from rushing? The other thing is Jackson State has allowed teams to get out and then, quote-unquote, walk them down. So, and FAMU has not won a game from in front yet this year. So, how do those uh, dynamics uh, meet up with each other? And if I'm John Grant and the rest of this team in Atlanta, I have to be happy with what I am seeing on uh, when it comes to these teams. Because I'm going to the file cabinet, I'm pulling out those old marketing plans. You know what? <laughs> because if FAMU winds up winning this game, I already know how to market the FAMU crowd because they were there last year. If Jackson State wins this game, I know how to market to that crowd because they were there two or three years ago. You know, if, if you go if you go to the West and Alcorn somehow comes out of this thing. Hell, I got four years of history with Alcorn uh, being in the uh, in, in the Celebration Bowl. Flipping over to the BAC, uh, North Carolina Central. Hell, they was there two years. They was there two years ago. South Carolina State was there three years ago. So, this, you know, we always talk about data points, Dr. Cavill, on this show. Yeah. John Grant and his team already has data points as far as the non-football side of what could potentially happen and can start really planning some stuff out early. The only thing that I'm going to say to y'all, SWAC fans, you only got one week instead of two weeks this year. Go ahead and get your tickets now. If your team don't get there, sell them on the secondary market because I guarantee you it's going to be a, it's going to be a hot sale. Go ahead and get your tickets now. Sell it on the secondary market. Now, that's what I, the way I talk about, talking about a matchup and all things together. Well done, A.D. Drew. Going to you, Brian. What are your thoughts in terms of the matchup? Is this the game where you start making plans? Is it going to build up, going to do what it's supposed to do? Uh, well, th this was my preseason game of the year. Uh, so good to know that here at the midway point of the season that it has lived up to the hype. And I think based on what I have seen from the teams in the SWAT, you know, these are the two best teams, in my opinion, in the SWAT. Um, so let all that hype shine. Let it let it shine. I, I love the fact that you brought up the history. Um, these are two of the blue blood programs. Um, Mount Rushmore, however you want to, however you want to coin the phrase. Uh, I think these are these are two of the four. So this should get all of the hype, maybe not all of the attention, because it's going to be a great day of college football, but it should be right up there. Um, I think in the preseason, FAMU was, uh, I believe this was one of the one or two games in which FAMU was not an overwhelming favorite. Uh, FAMU was probably about a three-point favorite preseason. Uh, when I just looked at some, some data, Jackson State is about a one and a half to two point favorite, and I and honestly, I would think Jackson State about a three point favorite. If I were if I were setting the line, I would set it as a two and a half or three point. No, favorite. you wouldn't. No, you can't. Oh my god, that's that's the whole field. Hold on, hold on. Set up the time for us. 
That that is the that is the whole. I'm giving an even game. I'm giving a two and a half to three point margin for the home field advantage. That's all. That's all I'm saying, Charles. So I mean, so you know, and I, and I think the data would the data would back me up. This is where I say. This is why I say. This is why you look for. This is where you look for numbers. So I'm telling you, folks out there, if you see a two and a half or three points for Jackson State, you know, be cautious. You know, be cautious. Go, go, go get fam you while you can get them, because money will come pouring in on Jackson State. You know, because I think uh, y'all in Mississippi they have legalized sports wagering, so money will come pouring in. And then all of a sudden, you know, game time, it'll probably be about a pick. That's my prediction. But, you know, looking forward to it. JSU hate week. JSU hate week. Bring it. <laughs> Thank you, know, you uh, Charles. Great stuff. Way to bring it, Brian. Charles, let's get your retort in terms of this. You had A.D. Drew played it all the way out to the celebration bowl, which I love. You had Brian talking about the odds, betting odds, setting it up. You have folks coming in here looking at and talking about fam you has to stop Jackson State's running game. You got folks talking about the game going back to home and home uh over the years. You got folks looking at Jackson State in terms of them finding a way to stop uh and being able to make moves on FAMU's defense is not as strong. So it's gonna be interesting to see what this looks like. And I want to hear from you, Charles, uh the gentleman that does color that talks about play-by-play, play, that finds a way to give the nuggets needed for folks to consider, as you did in your last movie with the Texas Southern Southern game. Give us an insight of what to watch in this game and from a perspective of what needs to take place. And is this the game ultimately that will decide not only the Eastern Division, but the SWAC Championship? You know, a lot of games need to be played. I know you say play it week to week, but generally, how big is this game in terms of the matchup? Again, you have a top 25 team in FAMU, a top three team in my polls. It's going to be top five teams, a team coming in ranked number one in many teams coming into the season, a defending HBCU national champion coming into the house uh, that where fans will be rabid. You know they'll be without a doubt, at least 30, 35,000 fans. Some people will say 40, yeah. uh, depending on how things kind of build up. It's been flexed. I, I, I'll push it 50, I'll push it 50, Doc. It's been flexed, if you would, uh, to ESPN as a primetime game for them to put up there on ESPNU. So our eyes will be on Jackson. Tell us what you know and what this means for the city of Jackson, the way they get down with HBC football and represent the swag, right? Oh, no doubt about it. I mean, when you talk about college football in the city of Jackson and the love around Jackson State football, this is a huge football game. Uh, I think the event will be rocking. I need Brian to use all his contacts to reach out to Will Packer, put the money down, bring the 100 in. I mean, this game is on prime time. You want both bands there, right? So, I mean, uh, you, you got to have that. But, I mean, this is a game where Jackson State's secondary will be tested. They're seeing a good quarterback in Daniel Richardson. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that should concern Jackson State fans. Number two point, we've seen FAMU have the ability to close games. That's not something exactly we've seen from Jackson State because, to your point, A.D., they'll jump out on you in some type of way. They take their foot off the pedal. So that is a, con uh, a concern of mine with regards to how the fourth quarter might play out, whether Jackson State is, you know, has a lead, can they defend the lead or whatever the case might be. The third point of that, like you said, Jackson State can run the football. They got a bevy of backs that they'll throw at you. And the, back, and the question becomes, can FAMU stop Jackson State's running game? And – I still haven't seen FAMU with that balance that I that I would love to see. I know they have backs, but I just haven't seen the running game get up and going just yet with regards to FAMU. But when you talk about the history, Doc, the height, I mean, this is what, you know, uh, HBCU football is about. You talk about 
quote unquote the blue blood programs meet each other in the regular season. It's what the third Saturday in October. All the elements of there. You need all the elements. You need both bands too. So I mean, I'm really looking forward to getting to Jackson this weekend. Hopefully, I can pin down John Grant and we can play a little bit of golf and, and catch this game as well. But really looking forward to uh, watching what I think is kind of could be. I don't know, de facto what? Uh swag champion that, that, that could that could get this uh win. Good stuff, good stuff. I know obviously Jack State Southern game is high up there in terms of rivalry. Uh and then you obviously have the in-state rivalry with Jack State Alcorn. And there's a couple of games where it meant something in some fashion, some ways, and still could be even bigger this year. The way things are setting up going into that last game of the season before the championship game. Right now, in terms of how it's played out the last three years, this may not be quote unquote a rivalry game between these two teams in terms of fans see it in their index by the definition they play rivalry in that. I will tell you this though, it's certainly been the most important game oh, yeah. the for these two teams in terms of coming out and getting the victory. Can't argue with that. But we being said, as we start to get prepared to close out. Let me get down the ledger with the CIAA and SIAC some matchups and get your thoughts generally in terms of which game you're looking at or two. Uh, we have in the CIAA uh, Shaw going in Johnson C. Smith. Uh, top 10 matchup there. The interesting stand. You have Bluefield State at Bowie State. You have Virginia Union at Lincoln, Pennsylvania. Virginia State at Elizabeth City State. And Winston-Salem State Rams against Livingston, another Top 10 matchup. Yeah, top that's seven. the one. For those, that's the one for a lot of folks. Uh, let me give you some updates in terms of what that means in the CIAA uh, in terms of turning the place to the SIC. Morehouse at Albany State. Miles at Clark, Atlanta. Is that homecoming? Uh, South Carolina State gets into action as you have a matchup for Valley State as they travel to South Carolina State. In terms of that matchup, Kentucky State at Tuskegee. Uh, A.D. Drew has told you, keep your eyes on Tuskegee. Uh, they're quietly doing what they need to do, like a tiger in the jungle, uh, getting prepared maybe to bounce late in the season. We'll see if they can continue to move in that direction. Central State versus Lane as they're on the road there, going to Lane, uh, Jackson, Tennessee. You have Savannah State at Edward Waters. The matchup early on, it seemed like it was about to be a big, thing, but not so much, but still important for these teams. Savannah State hits the road and goes to Jacksonville, Florida. Benedict at Allen, a battle of South Carolina, Columbia, South Carolina, so that's an interesting matchup there in terms of what's taking place. Let's get into the major division of what goes on in week eight. Uh, Fort Valley State at South Carolina State, I already told you, a big one that has a lot of people have been talked about for a while is you have Tennessee State at Howard, which A.D. Drew talked about how things shake up. This is a big matchup. Obviously, homecoming for Howard for them. Huge for Tennessee State if they want to find a way uh, of how they can bump things up or put their stake on a national championship. This is a game they need to make sure they have. With that being said, not a lot of other matchups and swag people are taking off before they get into the conference play next week. Um, but you do have this game in what I – I always call the Colonial Athletic Association. I know that they changed the name to the Cultural Athletic Association. I get it right. The CIAA is the vernacular they use. Uh, but you talk about week eight, the game that I'm going to talk about is Hampton at North Carolina a and homecoming game. Hampton's band will not be there, but they may not need it the way they're playing football. Can they bounce back and continue to put A&T in their place? Well, Aggies rise up as they did against Richmond, make it interesting or – may have the upset of the year, the general talk in terms of Hampton the A&T. Can they make that move? Let's go into the squack where things get big. We've talked about, obviously, week eight, uh, FAMU at Jackson State. But another one, big one, quietly, is Alcorn State and Southern. Alcorn State comes in at four and three, Southern at three and three. But guess what? Uh, talk about the standings for these teams. You have Alcorn at three and oh. In Southern, even though it's taking overtime in both of their games, they're 2-0 in conference. So this is a big matchup to determine what that looks like. And it is Alcorn that's on the road 
They had a big victory this weekend as they traveled to Louisiana where they get a chance to do it again against their rival uh, at Southern. We'll see what that looks like. Yep, Arkansas Pine Bluff and Grambling quietly. This is an intriguing game. Pine Bluff got off the mat and had a good game. They won at home against Prairie View. Uh, can they do it again and really put the final nail in Grambling? Uh, as we see, Prairie View was bid to be up there. Grambling thought they would be in there. 0 and 2 for Grambling. They can't afford to take that third loss for sure. You got Bethune, Cookman, and Mississippi Valley. Save this for last. And I say that purposely. Both teams come in 0 and 6 in terms of what that looks like, but somebody is going to get their first win of the season, and that is always big and important in itself. Uh, Bethune Cookman and Valley are both 0-2 in conference play, so obviously one of them will get that win in terms of that matchup. So week eight is interesting all across the board. We talked about Valley. I mean, we talked about FAMU and Jackson State. Staying with you, Charles, as we again start to close up those games at Mitch, which one or two? Uh, has your interest uh, for week number eight? Uh, Miles at Clark. Uh, I think that's going to be a, a fun one. Uh, I mentioned Winston-Salem uh, versus Livingstone. And, of course, a big one in the swag, uh, I think, is uh, definitely Jack State fam. You Honorable mention, UAPB at Grandma. Uh, keep an eye on this UAPB team. Let me go to you, A.D. Drew. What are your thoughts on this weekend? What sticks in your mind in terms of big games to be played this week? Well, Charles uh, took took one of my uh, key games, so uh, I want to focus on a non-conference matchup. You got Fort Valley traveling to South Carolina State. Uh, Fort Valley, who's definitely in the hunt in the SIAC, does this hurt them traveling to South Carolina State at this point in time in the year? Uh, that that's one game. Uh, never did I think I would say Livingstone would be on my top games list but right. you, you you have to when you talk Livingstone you have to put them out there but the one that I really want to look at is Bethune and Valley because whoever loses this game it's going to be tough for them to catch one this year not saying that they won't but the schedule is not in their favor for them to catch another game this year Valley has a little bit better of a chance than Bethune but it's, it's now or never for one of these uh, coaches to try to get that goose egg off of their uh, back. Good stuff, good stuff. Brian, uh, you get to close us off as you officially wait a little while later this afternoon. Uh, call me if you need me. I might be able to set some things up. If you need another hand this evening, we can talk a little bit more. and I can flip roles with you and see what I can bring to the table. I know you are moving forward as A.D. Drew uh, blesses us in his way getting stuff done. We're so proud of him and what he's doing at Morehouse Marketing, man. We got Charles doing his thing out there, play-by-play in color. Man, BCSN, Inside HBC, Sports Lab, Sports Rap, man. We got some folks that are talented. And don't leave out Brian. He calls games, too, and he has a couple coming up. But with that being said, let me go to Brian to close it out appropriately and tell me, what else is on his mind this weekend? Does he say things in a way that other folks can't do it? One of the ways he does it, because he always makes sure you understand the betting lines. And some of us not there, but some of us rate and really take him seriously because he's helped make some folks some good money if it's nothing else but pizza or gas money. Uh, or sometimes a little traveling money when they get an extra chance to get some food. Uh, particular as they get ready to celebrate for the show and talk about the fact that they're not either quiet as a mouse or they are doing a dance or jig. And talk about <laughs> we'll see what side they fall on this weekend. But Brian, take us home and tell us what are your thoughts this weekend. Uh, I, I saw AMT Roy post this. Hampton's band. Hampton's band should just travel to Greensboro and just play outside the stadium. Just pull, up, just pull up the bus and say, oh, since you won't let us come, we're going to take a lot, and we're just going to play outside the stadium. We're going to play all game. All game we're going to play, and we're going to be a pest while our football team rolls into that stadium and destroys the greatest homecoming that no one ever agreed on. They're just going to go in there. <laughs> 
know, Hampton's not that petty, and I and I know that. I have much respect for Hampton. They're better than me. But if I'm Hampton, if I'm an alum of Hampton, I'm footing the bill for the entire band to take a day off and travel. And we're just going to take an RV spot, and we're just going to own an RV spot outside the stadium and play. And we're going to let our team know that we're there, even though you're so petty that you won't let us have a spot in the stadium. But anyway, um, I'm intrigued also by Tennessee State going to Howard. Another chance for a road team to ruin homecoming. That's going to be the key for tomorrow. How many homecomings are going to get ruined? Clark is on homecoming ruin watch. Uh, Howard on homecoming ruin watch. North Carolina A&T on homecoming ruin watch. Those are three games that are legitimate games in which the team coming in can very well ruin homecoming for you and your alumni. I, I'm fascinated by that. I know I'm fascinated by the game of the year, but I'm also fascinated by the worst game of the year. No, Toilet bowl. We gotta re, we gotta remarket that. We gotta remarket that because you know we didn't talk about the fact that uh, Kentucky State finally got a win. Uh, Lincoln, Lincoln. PA, Lincoln, PA finally got a win, and it just leaves two FCS programs. And look, Bethune hadn't been right since Ed Reed tried to tell the truth. Ed Reed tried to tell the truth. And y'all ran him out of there. And guess what? The curse of Ed Reed is laying upon Mother McLeod, Mary Bethune. Uh, it is laying there. And blame Ed Reed. That's all I'm saying. Blame Ed Reed. That's what I'm looking for. Go back. That's all I'm going to say. Valley at home by 40. Oh, my. <laughs> Good stuff, good stuff. Perfect way to close it as I get prepared to make sure I finish up on my tomato juice. Oh, and Brian, I'm going to just invite myself on the ONG Strike Zone this week. Thank you. I love it. <laughs> I love it. We, got, we got room for you. We got room for you. Come on. Cool. For sure. Make sure you put that invitation out there. I have just enough time to make sure I go to the game lounge and do what's necessary to close down Las Vegas. <laughs> Uh, as I do seriously have to go to Palm Springs, as I'll be in Indian Wells, California, for a dean retreat. These are deans of college education hosted by Ohio State, talking about the state of uh, education and where we need to continue to grow. And as a representative of the Texas Southern University, I want to make sure our voice is heard for HBCUs. Specifically, I'll be here. Shout out to Howard, because next week I'll be in Washington, D.C., as we have an event similar to this in terms of education at Howard University is hosting HBCU uh, deans specifically in terms of continue to do the thing uh, to support uh, the educational needs of this country. Well, like I said, we're tuning off here. Great commentary. Make sure you show up tonight, Brian and AD, particularly Brian for Sports Wrap. Uh, next week, we'll be back on it on Tuesday. And Thursday, inside the HBC Sports Lab, we'll have our independent show on Wednesday. We should also have a show on Friday. Working on A.D. Drew to pick up some stuff, and we might even add a Monday, too. It may be a little closer to the celebration time, but uh, we have some special places where we'll jump in on Mondays and do a little D2 talk. I know Steven uh, gets out there and gets it done and gets it for us, but we'll also do our version to make sure that we spread the love from the CIAA to SIEC and the independents, include the NIA programs. Like I said, I have a flight at 9 10, so I have just enough time. That is West Coast time. That means 11 uh, 10 for you all in Central and 12 10 uh, for the East Coast. So, well traveler getting it done uh, as we do it. Thank you for listening inside the HBCU Sports Lab. Make sure you share our podcast with your friends and colleagues. I am Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, the Dean of HBCU Sports, coming from inside the lab in the College of HBCU Sports with Mike Washington Charles Bishop. Also, as we continue to move forward, we do have the National Battle uh, Bands Championship in terms of how that will go. Those continue to be released. We saw the first one. Those matchups start to become more important. You know what we do on our show. I hadn't released our programs, but we'll talk about it. For us, it has to be about matchups. There has to be a winner and loser. That is the marching sport of what we do here. Uh, we'll, we'll not fade the black, but we'll kind of let the folks do what they do on their side. But we wanted to know uh, where we come from in that platform. 
Again, we want to thank you for listening to Dr. Bills inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop, every Tuesday and Thursday at 6 o'clock. Sundays at 9, we pushed it to 9.30 to make sure I can get here and set up. Uh, but I'm looking at it thankfully to uh, my waitress here at Jose Bravo Tequila, Tequila Maria. Give a little shout out. She took care of me, made sure I had a spot set up so we could do the show. I want to give a special shout out there. And I did tip her kindly because she took care of your boy, uh, the dean of HBC Sports. We look forward to next week, Tuesday to be exact, as we give you the latest news in the lab. Follow me, Dr. Kenyatta Cabell, on Twitter. I call it Twitter because I can. Facebook and Instagram, D-R-K-N-Y-A-T-T-A, C-A-B-I-L. That's inside the HBC Sports Lab 1 on Twitter, inside the HBC Sports Lab on YouTube. We have our stuff on threads as well. Make sure you grow and check that out there. Alternative to X for sure uh, in terms of Twitter. Green Big, continue to move forward. We will talk with you soon. Charles. Of course. AD. Lecture. Brian. Dismissed.